So taking our discussion about mortgages and loans a little bit further, but certainly keeping it at a high level just for a moment, we need to explore mortgages in more detail. And these are secured borrowing arrangements, as we've already mentioned, where essentially the house is often offered as security over the loan, the mortgage being the security as opposed to the loan. The property will be temporarily assigned to the lender, which essentially means that they have right of possession of that property in the event that you don't keep, on, keep up your repayments, albeit they will never actually take ownership of the property. Their essential assignment allows them to sell the property on your behalf in the event that you don't keep up with your repayments. Loans themselves are unsecured borrowing where security is not always required. However, certain loans, particularly those for small businesses or for limited companies, are likely to require some kind of security being offered. So let's concentrate more on mortgages for the time being and the different methods of repaying a mortgage debt. So essentially, we've got two main ways that you can borrow money. And rewind 30 years, uh, as many interest-only and capital and interest mortgages were, were arranged as each other. In other words, there was roughly a 50-50 split. Nowadays, it is very much 95-5% in favour of capital and interest. So capital and interest mortgages essentially means that every repayment that you make, in part, pays interest and in part pays capital. So your payments always cover the interest in full plus an element of capital repayment. So over time, what you'll find is that essentially, whilst the amount you pay off your mortgage will remain the same, each payment will subtly change with more capital being paid off and less interest as you reduce your debt. The good thing about capital and interest mortgage is that you know that the mortgage will be repaid in full throughout the term. There'll be no nasty surprises at the end. You meet your commitments each month over the period of time. The house will be yours, but there'll be no surplus. Under an interest-only mortgage, as the name would suggest, the only monthly repayments you make are to cover the interest each month. The interest will not reduce because, essentially, you are not paying any of the capital back. The capital itself will need repaying. So, ultimately, that will be repaid at the end, normally from a savings plan that will be set up by the borrower, be that through a pension, be that through an ISA, be that through something formal like an endowment. And as we've already said, these are not very common anymore. The vast majority of mortgages now are capital and interest rather than being interest only. Interest only mortgages since the mortgage market review, generally speaking, require a formal means of repayment set up and in place before they'll even consider the mortgage itself. So I think it's important to understand that irrespective of whether you're arranging a capital and interest or an interest only mortgage, these can be arranged with certain mortgage deals attached. These deals tend to be over a fixed period of time and you might have multiple deals on your mortgage over the years. We need to understand the pros and cons of each type. So let's have a look at these on the next slide. So here we can see the first set of mortgage deals, the more common ones that are going to be shown here. We've got two slides of these, but on this one we're going to look at fixed rate mortgage deals, standard rate deals, discounted and tracker deals. So uh, let's take these one at a time and understand what they are and their pros and cons. So a fixed rate is essentially where the interest is fixed for a set period of time. And I think it's fair to say that in the UK, the majority of fixed rate deals are usually five, uh, two to five years. The advantages of a fixed rate deal is that it provides a known cost over the period of time that the deal is in place. The benefit basically is there if the rates increase. However, you will not benefit from any rate reductions and you also have a firm commitment to the mortgage uh, lender over that period of time, with often penalties being in place if you want to fin come out of your fixed rate deal early. A standard mortgage rate essentially does not have a fixed rate, the rate will change. Generally speaking, each mortgage company will have their own standard variable rate. This will be linked in turn to the Bank of England's base rate. The lender's rate will vary, it can go up, it can go down, so there's no surety of your actual costs going forward. If rates go up, 
typically your your, your uh, costs will go up if rates decrease then of course the amount that you pay will go down a discounted rate is something that's linked to that standard rate essentially a discount below or potentially sometimes a slightly above the standard rate of the actual mortgage deal over a set period of time. So essentially a discounted rate could be a quarter of a percent below the standard variable rate as an example. The variable interest is also charged therefore and this actually could lead to exactly the same as the standard rate an increase in mortgage repayments if rates go up a decrease in mortgage repayments if rates go down. Tracker rates became pa uh, popular in the late 1990s and through the notice, where basically the mortgage rate tracks a certain um, um, base rate and the Bank of England base rate is the most common that a tracker rate will actually apply. This also leads to a variable interest being charged and essentially these often were linked to the Bank of England base rate as we've just mentioned with a rate above that being fixed for a period of time. Lifetime trackers were quite common. In other words, you'd have a lifetime tracker mortgage, which essentially kept you at a quarter of a percent above base rate, whatever that was, for the entire term of your mortgage. So you'd benefit from any cuts in interest rates, but also see your rates increase as it goes up. So essentially, the standard rates, discounted rates and tracker rates are variation of a theme. Then we turn into the ones that are probably less common. We've got CAT, we're going to look at CAP and COLLAR, flexible mortgage deals, offset mortgage deals and also Euro mortgages. So let's look at these in more detail one at a time. Starting with the CAT mortgage. Well essentially this is a variable interest rate deal but there's a maximum CAP that's applied. In other words, interest charged cannot rise above the CAP. So you might have a, a capped mortgage at 2.5% and if base rate goes to 2.75, you can't go above 2.5%. So you can benefit from rate cuts, but you actually can be only experience rate gains up to essentially the cap that's put in place. A cap and collar is quite similar, except there is also a minimum criteria that can be met. Again, variable interest rate is charged but interest rates can fluctuate between the maximum cap and the minimum collar over the period of the time of the mortgage. So rates cannot rise above the cap, but neither can they fall below the collar. And these actually are probably more common than capped rates and in isolation. Then we're into the various different flexible mortgage arrangements. A fully flexible mortgage could be essentially fixed or variable over a period of time, but will allow for certain flexibility in the repayments. In other words, you can make additional ad hoc re um, repayments within certain periods of time. So maybe you're allowed to take a, a flexible and ad hoc extra repayment of up to 10% of the value of your mortgage. Maybe you also could add more money to your mortgage or take extra repayment holidays over certain periods of time. Fully flexible mortgage deals have countless number of different flexible options that can be tagged and some flexible options mortgages will have more than others. Offset mortgages were very common in the 1990s when interest rates were a little bit higher than what they are now. The idea being is that a mortgage is set up linked to your savings account and essentially your savings accounts are linked and offset against your mortgage amount. So perhaps you had a mortgage of £200,000 and you had a savings account with £50,000 in it. You could link these together. You could offset the £50,000 in your savings against your £200,000 mortgage, essentially meaning you only paid interest on £150,000. This had the effect of meaning that essentially you got the same rate of interest on your savings as you did on your mortgage. So you'd only pay interest on the residual amount. As interest rates have dropped to record levels now, these aren't as popular as they once were. The most extreme of offset mortgages was the mortgage, credit, uh, mortgage bank accounts, where essentially your entire uh, wealth was all contained in one account. Your mortgage, your, your savings and your uh, 
your day-to-day -to -day banking needs were all met by one account. And that actually meant that essentially as you got paid your salary, you made a temporary re repayment of part of your mortgage deal. Finally, we've got Euro mortgage deals, essentially mortgages in euros. You can get these in dollars as well, known as dollar mortgages, but mortgage, Euro mortgages are the only ones mentioned in our book. These are ideal for obviously buying houses within different currency. So you can essentially uh, borrow money in foreign currencies to buy uh, houses abroad. The problem with this is you are then exposed to currency risk because not only have you got the debt but also any movements in the value of sterling could hurt or perhaps help you in terms of the future actual amount of, uh, uh, of money that you owe relevant to sterling. Now we're going to turn our attention to the much more specialist mortgage products which uh, require specific advice and specific qualification. So if you want to uh, take advice on equity release, then typically you're going to need to, hire, to meet with an advisor that's got the prerequisite qualifications in this specialist area. So equity release is essentially um, where you've already repaid off your mortgage, you're debt free, you're over the age of 60, and you want to release some of this wealth, this equity that's within your property without actually leaving the property itself. So it allows you to free up the money from the property without selling it. A lifetime mortgage can be taken, which essentially is a new mortgage for the rest of your life. We'll look at that in more detail. Or you could go through a home reversion plan, which actually is old school equity release, which does effectively involve the sale of your property, but not on the open market, but a sale to a mortgage company. Both of these will be explored on the next slide. So let's take these one at a time and consider the key fundamental differences between the two uh, equity release products, the lifetime mortgage and the home reversion plan. So a lifetime mortgage, as we've already alluded to, is where essentially you take a new debt out on your house, secured by your home, for an amount that essentially is the amount you want to release from your home. And you can increase the amount that you actually borrow in stages if you wish, or alternatively borrow the money all in one go. So essentially what happens here is you take a mortgage for your lifetime with the intention that that will be repaid on your death, perhaps by the sale of the property by the next generation who inherit the home. So this does not involve the sale of the property at all. The interest on this loan will either roll up and be added to the debt, increasing the debt that needs to be paid on death, or alternatively, you'll find that the interest is paid on an ongoing basis. Crucially, the home is still owned by the, the borrower here. So essentially, any future increases in the value of the house will be preserved within the family environment. The house, of course, remains in your name and obviously does not need to be sold by your next of kin if they've got other means of repayment. In other words, it does give the opportunity for the individuals who inherit your home to keep the family home and find alternative means, perhaps in terms of a life cover, of paying off the debt. Home reversion plans are what we would probably consider to be the more traditional equity release plans. This is where part of your home, or even all of your home, is going to be sold to a mortgage company. You will actually sign a tenancy agreement with the mortgage company giving you right of occupancy until your death. So the mortgage company, whilst being the owner, technically speaking, will not be able to kick you on out onto the streets until such time as actually you've passed away and then at that time the house will revert fully and, and totally to them and they can do what they want with it. So a home reversion plan essentially normally involves a reduced purchase price to reflect the fact that the mortgage company essentially will let you live within the house for the rest of your days, although you will ultimately pay a nominal rent through this. It's important to understand that under a home reversion plan, essentially, the, potentially all of the house will not form part of your estate in the event of your death, nor can it be left to the next generation. The house is essentially sold when the deal is completed. Within the realms of financial services, there are certain aspects of it that do not comply with certain religious beliefs and laws. 
and uh, we'll look at these um, over the course of this particular chapter and here we're going to stop and look at home purchase plans which essentially are mortgage arrangements in inverted commas that can be set up that allow somebody who has strong religious beliefs who uh, whose, whose religious beliefs will not allow them to borrow money essentially to buy in inverted commas their home so we're going to look at Sharia compliant mortgages here and two different sorts, the Ajara and the Diminishing Mashakra. So uh, let's deal with the uh, Ajara first. Ajara mortgages are essentially where you make repayments and these are stored up by the lender, almost like a savings plan, which will be used to repay your mortgage at the end of the term. In other words, you're not technically speaking here um, uh, having a debt, so to speak, over the period of time. These are popular, certainly, in uh, Islamic mortgage arrangements. Then we've got uh, diminishing masharika, and these are essentially rental agreements where each time that you pay a monthly rent, this essentially is deemed to be increasing your share of the property over a period of time. So essentially, you make your repayments, which is considered to be predominantly rent originally, and over time, you basically transfer the ownership of the actual property over to the, uh, the, the purchaser. Of course, mortgages can be taken to buy not only the family home, but also to buy an investment property, a buy-to-let uh, property, an additional property to rent out. And uh, these buy-to-let mortgages essentially are typically more expensive in terms of their rates than your standard uh, homes that you would buy to live in yourself. So this is about buying a house to rent out to a tenant. We've got two different categories of this. First of all, consumer buy-to-lets. And these are essentially accidental landlords, for example, things like inherited property. And these particular mortgages, if money's borrowed against these, is FCA regulated. Then we've got the more uh, commercial arrangement of the business buy-to-lets, which is where professional landlords will generally speak in buy houses to rent out as a business ongoing concern. These are not fully FCA regulated, which essentially means that there is not the need to take the same degree of advice. Of course, buying properties as second homes is a popular means of investing, and many CVs as ways of meeting their retirement needs in the future, or perhaps their ongoing income and expenditure needs throughout their lifetime. Loans themselves are essentially unsecured borrowing arrangements, and these can fall into two categories. So you've got structured loans, which essentially are often fixed interest over a fixed term with little flexibility. Most personal loans and higher purchase arrangements will fall into structured loan categories. And then you've got unstructured loans, which offer variable terms, essentially, perhaps an interest rate that's linked or floats, where you're able to make ad hoc reductions, offering a degree of flexibility. So lots of commercial loans are essentially unstructured. Even mortgages, which can be, of course, be secured borrowing, are essentially unstructured loan facilities. So it's important to understand the general uh, premise between the two of them. But actually, more flexibility lies with unstructured loans. Most of us, though, will encounter structured loans in ways to buy cars, pay for holidays, etc.